you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Rachel Stucker. I'm the Executive Director of Housing Alliance Delaware, and I'm very excited to have um, some very distinguished local, regional, national guests here with us today um, to talk about and to help us understand family homelessness um, here in Delaware. Um, Today we are uh, officially presenting findings um, from a report conducted by the University of Delaware Community Center for Community Research and Service. Um, Dr. Steve Matro, as well as uh, Dr. Dennis Colhane from the University of Pennsylvania, um, studied family homelessness in Delaware and authored a report. And today we are here to um, share the findings of that report and talk about how we can move forward to address family homelessness and discuss opportunities for doing so, some of which I think maybe once in a lifetime opportunities to leverage resources to really make an impact um, for not just family homelessness, but homelessness generally here in our state. Um, so today's agenda is gonna look very much like a presentation of findings um, and uh, Dr. Steve Matro, Associate Professor at the University of Delaware's Biden School of Public Policy and Administration where he is also the director of the Biden School Center for Community Research and Service is going to be presenting those findings and recommendations. Um, his research, uh, which has focused on housing, homelessness and health is nationally renowned. And we are very privileged and lucky locally to have him as a member of the Delaware Continuum of Care Board. Um, after his presentation um, and the presentation of the report's findings, we're gonna have a facilitated panel discussion. We're joined today by three panelists um, both uh, local and national experts, Nicole Waters from Newcastle County, many of you, um, I see and recognize your names and you know Nicole. Um, so we're very excited to hear from her and her experience um, in the area of family homelessness, particularly this past year and the work she's been doing. Um, we're also joined by Dennis Colhane, professor at the School, um, the School of Social Policy at the University of Pennsylvania and Barbara Poppy of Barbara Poppy and Associates. Um, I will provide more uh, thorough uh, um, uh, introductions for our panelists when we get to that section of the agenda. Um, we will have a facilitated discussion, so we do have some questions that are pre-prepared, but we want you all to participate in that as well. Um, feel free to use the chat box to share your thoughts. Um, I'm gonna be plopping, and some members from the Housing Alliance team are gonna be plopping some links and informational resources in the chat box for you throughout today's presentation. Um, but if you have questions for the panelists at any time, please put those questions in the question and answer part of, of your Zoom. Um, we will collect those throughout and um, do our best to get all of them answered and addressed um, during the question and answer and discussion time, um, the second half of uh, today's webinar. So I think that is all of the housekeeping items I have. Again, welcome and thank you so much, Steve. I am going to pass it over to you um, to get started with the content for today. Thank you for being here. All right, thank you, Rachel. And um, welcome to everybody. Thank you for um, spending your, part of your afternoon with us. And um, the hardest part of this presentation is always getting the shared screen up and bear with me for a minute. Um, there and here we go, that wasn't too bad. Um, all right, and then I gotta make that small there. All right. Uh, Thank you, and um, thank you to Rachel, also to the Housing Alliance Delaware for providing the support that enabled us to do this um, to do this report. And um, along with myself, the team that put this report together is Josh Solge, who was a um, who has who was a grad student at the Biden School when this report was being put together, and is now um, in the planning department at the City of Newarks. And um, Olivia Mongi, who also who did. A lot of the um, the data work for this um, this report. Who is a grad student in the statistics department? Acknowledge their assistance, and then Dennis Colhane, who's of course a panelist, um, also um, worked on the team here. Grateful for everybody. They're responsible for the good stuff. I take responsibility for all of the other stuff. Um, the full report is available at the link on the bottom here. Um, like I tell my class when I lecture on specific readings, the what the presentation that I'm going to do here kind of takes what I consider to be the most important things from the report. Um, because of time constraints, it leaves out a lot of other things that are still important that many of you may find interesting. So, um, so there's a lot in the report that we won't get to today. So I encourage you to, um, if this interests you to take some time, if you've not done so already and go over the report and, um, 
And of a limited amount of time, so I'm going to do this quickly. Also, going to try real hard. There's you know various things that I want to get in, and I'm going to, and in a limited amount of time, none of this, you know, none of the data presented is too complicated. So if there's a problem with understanding it, that is a problem on my end rather than a problem on your end. So I encourage you to to ask questions to clarify, or um, or to go to the report where a lot of times this will. It'll be, um, you know, our the findings that I bring up will be discussed and presented in further detail. Um, I'm breaking this presentation down into four sections. First, kind of, first is kind of the impetus for doing this report in the first place is the re the recent increase in homeless families, which I will. Um, which I'll go over and dig a little deeper into and get a better understanding of the dynamics going on. Um, then going over temporary housing, which is shelter, transitional housing, and ho and hotel and motel vouchers, kind of give an overview of that. Um, go over permanent housing options that are available for homeless families, and then recommendations. Throughout the report, the focus here is exclusively on the homeless family population. We're not going to look at homeless families per se in terms of I'm not going to be spending any time on their demographics or characteristics or things like that, as much as we're going to looking at some at the homeless families as a population and then mostly on the services that are available in response to the um, in response to homeless families and how they're adjusting um, to the to the in, how they're responding to the increase and also um, interrelated to um, the the ongoing COVID pandemic. Um, so first, I'm going to go ahead and kind of kind of present the problem: the increase in homeless families. And I'm going to start with something that is probably familiar to most of you, and those are numbers from the annual point in time count. These are numbers for families in Delaware that goes back a decade. In case somebody doesn't know, point in time count is a is a national count that's done in Delaware. It's you know focusing on Delaware. It's a statewide count of the homeless population where people literally go out and count people in shelters and transitional housing and in hotels and motels and in other places where homeless people might be. Um, this this figure just shows that for, for homeless families, the blue bars are the number of families and the orange bars are the number of people in the families. And if you go back in the decade, I mean, the numbers, the, the count numbers have been pretty steady. Um, in 2020, they have increased to a point to their highest point within a decade. And then I think the remarkable and also concerning um, uh, thing is when you compare that to 2021, where the number of homeless families and the people in the families almost doubled. That is, I have never seen a year-to-year -year pit count increase of that kind of a magnitude, and that is of a lot of concern. There is obviously a large increase in the homeless, in the population of homeless families that are, you know, the, the number of homeless families that find themselves um, homeless on a given night. And before I get into looking at the services, basically going to dig um, a bit deeper as much as the data will allow into the dynamics of what's going on behind that increase. Um, so there are several data sources that are available that are going to help us do that. First is data that was shared that was that was shared um, by the by the state of Delaware, the um, Division of State Service Centers, and they graciously provided their data on um, on families that were um, that received hotel and motel vouchers, and they they have three years worth of data. And what this is are the average are the average number of families that are homeless that are that receive that are homeless and receive hotel and motel vouchers on a given night in a specific month. And that's for three years. So each of the different lines designates a different year. And if you look at the bottom two, and that's 2018 and 2019, the blue line and the orange line, what you see there is on an average night, the number of families that receive um, that receive hotel or motel vouchers kind of range from about 50 to about 90 families on an average night. And that number kind of continued in um, 
in 2020, kind of in, in January, it um, kind of started to raise a little bit. And then in March of 2020, which is, of course, when the COVID pandemic hit, that num the number of families that um, received hotel and motel vouchers went up quite a bit. In fact, it um, from January to November of 2020, that number just about tripled to where on an average night, the state service centers were giving out three times, were paying for hotel accommodations through vouchers for about three times as many families as they had in the previous two years. So again, really kind of an unprecedented increase. I'll go into those details a little bit, a little bit more because um, again, that had um, significant repercussions throughout the whole system. Um, digging into the state service center data a little bit more deeply, we have um, this figure, which is also in the report, and this kind of shows two dynamics. And this is, if you know, looking at the bars first, what we showed both in the point in time count and in the figure that I just showed you, that was the that what those were numbers of families who were homeless on a given night. What these bars show is the number of families that are homeless over the course of a given year. And what you kind of see here kind of looks like a paradox, which I'll, which I'll explain is, you know, in, tw in 2018 and 2019, the number, of fam the, the number of total families that received vouchers over the course of that year was relatively steady at about tw a little more than 1,200 a year. And in 2020, when the nightly number of homeless families went up it just about tripled, the number of total families in that year that received a voucher actually went down to about a thousand families. And so again, you have these, this kind of two very diverging trends where, the, where at any given time, the homeless family population was at unprecedented levels, but the number of families that were involved actually went down. And the reason for that has to do with the data that we show here on the orange line, which shows the average length of time that a family spent in a motel on a voucher in, in each of those three years. And again, there's the numbers are pretty steady, right around 20 days or about three weeks. The average family received a voucher for about three weeks in 2018 and 2019. And that number went up considerably from about three weeks to 62 days, which is, a, which is just about nine weeks. Um, so the average family stayed much longer. So you have two kind of different dynamics where the total number of families went down a little bit, but the average time that each of those families stayed um, increased, by, increased by quite a bit. And it's that that average stay that basically drove the that that drove the increase in homeless population much more than the number of families that were actually becoming homeless. And to make sure everybody understands that, I'm going to um, going to go to a diagram here, and this is kind of using looking at what are known as stocks and flows, and in in the um, kind of in the metaphor, if you look at what's going on in terms of a kitchen sink. And what you have is, you know, you have an inflow. And if you translate that into the into families, those are the families that are becoming homeless. And then you have an outflow, which are the which are the homeless families that are exiting the system. And then what is on this on this little figure here as the stock, that is the size of the homeless population at any given time. And so the, the size of the homeless population on a given night is kind of a function of the inflow and the outflow. So the, so the water will get higher, kind of the population will increase either if the inflow increases by quite a bit, if more families become homeless, or if the outflow, if the rate by which families are exiting homelessness slows down. And so the evidence we have is, you know, when families stay longer, that's an indication that families are having a much harder time getting out of homelessness, meaning basically the system is backing up. If you look at it from the metaphor of this sink here, you know, the, the, the drain is clogging and the families are, it's taking much longer for them to leave. And as a result, the population is getting, you know, the, 
the population of homeless at any given point of time is, is increasing. And that seems to be what's going on here. So if we're going to address this problem, we have to address the, the clog at the exit rather than the inflow, which seems to be relatively steady and if anything is going down a little bit. Um, so we kind of looked at those dynamics a bit with the point in time count. We looked at it with the state service center data. We're going to turn to a third data set here, which is from the, um, the CMIS, which again, a lot of you are familiar with, but for those of you who aren't, CMIS stands for Community Management Information System. And that's the, um, that's the data repository that is uh, maintained by Housing Alliance Delaware on behalf of the continuum of care where, um, where the member providers are, you know, kind of report their report their their homeless services data. So shelter data, transitional housing data, other related homeless services data gets reported by many different agencies into one central repository. And that data is right now that data is independent of the state service center data. So where the state service center data covers the the hotel and motel data, the um, the CMIS data covers those families who are homeless in, um, in shelters or transitional housing. And kind of as a shorthand, I'll refer to both of those as sheltered, as, um, as sheltered families. And again, these are the, the total number of families that were recorded in each of the last four years. And what you'll see is that the numbers are, have been relatively steady and is, have again gone down by a bit in 2020. And that the, um, the length of stay data was not available for CMIS, so I can't give you the length of stay, but again, you have this dynamic where the annual number of families who become homeless has actually gone down a little bit. And it's a pretty safe bet that, the, that for the families who become homeless, the amount of time they have stayed in either transitional housing or in shelter has gone up. So we kind of have, and this, so you have kind of these shelter trends. This also underscores just kind of some of the limitations of the data that's available, which I'll be talking about again in the next slide where we kind of step back even a step further and we incorporate yet an additional data source. So we have the, family sh the families in shelter and transitional housing, the middle bar, which I just presented. We have the families in with hotel and motel vouchers, which, um, which was the state service center data, which I presented um, a few slides ago. And then the third data source comes from the Department of Education, which collects data on homeless youth. And this is, and the number here, there's 2,694 students in the state of Delaware, and this is the latest data they have available. So it's 2019, so this is pre-COVID, but it has, um, these are the number of students who are, who, who, the, um, who the individual school districts are aware are living in doubled up circumstances. And doubled, doubled up circumstances are considered homeless by the Department of Education stand definition. They are not considered homeless by the HUD definition, which is what the, which is what the other two data sets are going. But this is a useful set of data because this kind of signifies kind of a reservoir of very precariously housed families and you know just families that are at risk of becoming homeless at any given point and many of these families won't become homeless but um but they're kind of a pathway into homelessness and this is kind of in to some extent comparing apples and oranges in that doubled up students does not reflect families. I mean, there may be, you know, multiple students who are part of the same family, in which case that number would go down. There's also a lot of families that have children who are not in school or that the schools would miss as being doubled up. And so, um, and so, but what that kind of roughly indicates is for those families who are literally homeless, there's a much larger um, group of families who are living in very precarious circumstances that threaten to become homeless. And kind of by indirect means, as far as we can tell, this number has not, this, this number has kind of roughly stayed the same as far as we can tell. We don't have any direct indication, but this would be the number that would go that would kind of migrate over to the um, 
to the shelter system or to the um, or looking for hotel and motel vouchers if the inflow were to increase. And as yet, there's no evidence that that's happened, but there is kind of an kind of a looming danger that that can happen. That you know, while the inflow has been okay, that number could increase at any given time due to dynamics related to COVID, due to dynamics related to the um, to the eviction moratorium ending. And so, again, this is something that worries me is that, you know, we're focusing on the exits, but the inflow can also increase at any time. And I'm going to leave I'm going to leave that there. And what this figure also indicates is that these are three very, you know, these are three different data sets that essentially don't talk to each other. Um, they're um, where the families in shelters and transitional housing would ideally kind of come together with the families in hotel with hotel and motel vouchers to kind of to have one population of families that are homeless and that are receiving homeless um, homeless services, temporary housing services. This as yet doesn't exist. And while both the um, the Housing Alliance and the state service centers were gracious in providing these data. Um, the third data source, the Department of Education, this was a data source that I got online and that, you know, kind of where these numbers come from or how these numbers intersect with the other two bars are really kind of unknown for now. So again, it's kind of underscoring that along with an, you know, with a drastic increase in homeless families, there's also a very definite data problem. And this is perhaps not as urgent as, you know, families, as families, as the um, as the increase in homeless families, but in terms of looking for strategies to address homeless families, looking for you know in terms of planning for um, for accommodating the demand for homeless services among families, kind of the lack of a coordinated data system and having you know data sets that each kind of have different pieces of the information put together a report like this becomes very difficult, and it really you know for this. This data system needs to improve for us to have for um, for us to have a more coordinated response to homelessness. So this is something I'm going to keep coming back to: is the need for a better data system. And so, to wrap up where you know where we've been so far, these are so far the three key points that I want to emphasize. The first one, the one with the star next to it, because this is the most important one, is that there definitely has been a drastic increase in homeless families, and that this drastic increase comes from families staying homeless longer, and as of yet, not from increased numbers of homeless of families who are becoming homeless. And this is an important distinction to make in kind of looking at where to focus. Um, second, um, the other two points are the data point, which I the which I just mentioned, and which is again going to be a recurring issue, especially for putting together a report like this. Where um, right now, you know, we have some insights into the dynamics of why there's an increase in family homelessness, but this also leads to a lot of other questions that we can't answer without better data. And also that while we're going to focus on exits at any given point, you know, this, this, um, this problem could be made more acute if there is an increase in the inflow of families that are becoming homeless, which fortunately hasn't happened um, yet. So going on to part two, we're going to be looking at temporary housing. Temporary housing is kind of a, a term that has two different types of housing. So when families become homeless, they will either seek sh um, shelter or transitional housing services. And that is kind of one, um, one, one area of temporary housing. And then there's a second area, which are the hotel and motel vouchers, which we've already mentioned, which, are, which is also a form of emergency temporary housing for, um, for homeless families that is that is also getting treated. So I, I will look at kind of give an overview of each of these in turn, starting with the shelter and the transitional housing. And again, from here on forward, I'll just call them shelters. This is a list of the major shelter providers in um, in the state of Delaware. And there's a, there's a very small number of, um, 
of very small shelters that were not included. Um, these, um, these agencies, most of which provide both emergency shelter and transitional housing, um, these are the major providers. All of these, all, um, all nine of these providers were also gracious enough to, to have their, um, to have key people on their staff um, sit down with, with the project team for interviews where they kind of gave their views of, um, of what, how they were seeing, how they're seeing family services from their vantage point and kind of the trends they were seeing, the problems, services gaps and things like that. Um, very gracious in providing their time. Um, I'm assuming that at least some of you are, um, are here in the audience. And again, thank you. Um, and you can kind of see the breakdown of, you know, just the, the shelter capacity. There's roughly, there's shelter capacity for 196 families with roughly two, roughly 200 families. And the other thing that I'll point out is that there is, the concentration of these services are in Newcastle County. Um, and Kent County, there's a couple of shelters and there is one relatively small shelter in Sussex County. And that is, you know, that's a disparity that I want to make folks available for those of you in Sussex County. I imagine you are very well aware of that disparity for the people on the call from this um, from the state service centers who've also been very gracious in terms of sharing data and in um, sitting down for interviews and providing their perspectives. Um, it's the families in Sussex who can't access shelter, who have nowhere else to go, disproportionately end up with hotel and motel vouchers. Um, according to state service centers, Sussex families make up the majority of families that are housed um, that are housed with hotel and motel vouchers. And again, that's that is um, in response to the shortage of. Um, shelter facilities that are available in Sussex. So I wanted to highlight that. Um, and before I, you know, and then looking at, um, you know, looking at the, at the shelter perspective on the increase in homeless families, it's impossible to separate that from the impact that COVID-19 has had on, um, that has had on providing these services. And I go into, we go into detail on this in the, um, in the report. And I'm just gonna give a quick overview here where the, the table that I just showed um, signifies the official capacity, which has remained more or less unchanged from the previous years. I mean, at about 200, you know, accommodations for about 200 families, give or take. However, the, just kind of the, the working capacity for homeless families has actually gone down quite a bit because of COVID precautions and kind of the need to um, the you know the need to make accommodations for social distancing um, within shelters has led many shelters to be forced to reduce the number of families that have that they can provide shelter to. It's also um, led to all the shelters that we talk to, taking various other precautions, increasing um, increasing sanitation and cleaning, increasing the um, increasing the social distancing protocol that they've had, um, requiring masks, and also as part of intake, many shelters have implemented um, have implemented protocol either for COVID testing or for um, or for quarantining so that families can show that they are COVID free before they go into the shelter. And that's kind of had mixed results. And on one hand, on the good, on, you know, the good part of that is that has effectively basically prevented um, COVID outbreaks from occurring in any of the shelters in Delaware. A couple of shelters have reported a case of COVID here and there, but with quarantining, with putting, um, you know, with putting anti-COVID measures into place, that has prevented any kind of COVID outbreaks from occurring in any of the shelters. And that is, of course, a good thing. However, it has also led to situations where you kind of have this paradox that um, while the, capa the working capacity has decreased, there's also been, um, there has also been surplus capacity where, um, where shelters have had, um, have, have had space that has gone unused for families. So while 
these state service centers were getting deluged with um, with families um, with families seeking shelter. There has kind of been unused capacity in the um, in the shelters, and part of that is, you know, is directly related to COVID. In that families preferred um, preferred hotel and motel placements because you know for you know from public health reasons having you know, having their own units, having their own space is a much better from a public health standpoint in, um, in getting temporary housing. Also that, you know, a lot of times families, you know, were homeless, did not have a, immediately did not have a place to go and the increased COVID precautions have, um, you know, kind of created one more barrier in terms of coming into shelter. And that has, you know, and like all of us who, provide services know the more barriers that you put up for whatever reason you know kind of the less the harder it is for families to follow through and so they effectively get turned away and again i don't want to point any fingers but you know it's kind of a trade off with the covid precautions is, is that it's made it you know it's made it more difficult and less attractive for people to go into shelter and that's kind of an important dynamic to be aware of and so while we're talking kind of a bit about the relationship of state service center hotel hotel and motel vouchers to the kind of to the um the kind of the aggregate of shelter and family provide um shelter and transitional housing provision for families kind of goes okay um i'm sorry so kind of is a good point to turn to kind of the other dimension of temporary housing, which is hotel and motel vouchers. And again, the, the large, the vast majority of hotel and motel vouchers in the state of Delaware get, fun, get funded directly through the state and are given out by the state division of state service centers. And COVID-19, the, you know, once the pandemic broke out and there was, you know, shelters were less able to accommodate homeless families and there became a greater need for um, families to who didn't have housing to have social distancing, um, to be, have the ability to social distance or in some cases had to quarantine. And to, to address this kind of newfound demand the, the um basically the state charged the state service centers with increasing their provision of hotel motel vouchers the state service centers have also have always provided hotel and motel vouchers to a limited population and for a much more time limited point of, um uh, for a much more time limited time period of you know more like a couple of weeks rather than several months and all of a sudden you know just kind of the demand ballooned um, for increased hotel and motel vouchers and the state service centers really got got swamped by this and really did a good job in terms of accommodating this demand. I mean, like many other like many other workplaces, the um, state service centers were forced to go remote, which when you're when you're providing direct services creates um, very difficult and new circumstances in which to provide services. Um, their staff had increased rates of COVID, which created um, human resources issues. And, um, and in the face of this really had to, to, to ramp up and also to kind of expand and to deal with new challenges to their system. And, um, and so just kind of keeping that in mind, and then the second point that I want, or the second um, dynamic that I want to incorporate here, and several of you may have looked at the list of shelters that I provided a couple of slides ago and ask, well, where is the Hope Center? Hope Center is kind of a very high, pro high profile shelter that again, many of you are aware of, but for those of you who may not be, this was about a year ago, the um, Newcastle County using CARES Act money, um, bought a an empty Sheraton hotel and within the course of about six weeks retooled and converted that hotel into a shelter that had 190 units basically 190 hotel rooms be, 
hundred hotel rooms became places for homeless families and for homeless individuals to receive emergency shelter. And there's kind of a, a partnership. For, and the reason I put this in with the hotel motel vouchers is because a partnership kind of um, developed between Newcastle County and the state service centers where the state service center provided voucher support. And instead of paying motels, paid the Newcastle County directly for, um, for accommodations that in many cases were much better than other hotels and motels that provided that that received the vouchers and also had and also the hope center had a lot of other kind of collateral services that were housed there so there were case management services available there were other social services there were mental health services available and there was also a medical clinic that was available on site for the families to take advantage of and also to hopefully help them get out of um, temporary housing and back into more permanent housing. So that's the second point. And then the third point is that state is that the um, hotel and motel vouchers, which kind of reached all time highs um, for the point that through 2020, which is when we stopped getting X, when which beyond that into 2021, we no longer had access to those data. But by all indications, by various sources, by the second, by the summer of 2020, by kind of the latter part of 2020 and ongoing, the number of vouchers that have um, that have been provided to families has has um, has decreased as as homeless families have been transitioned out of. Um, um, voucher arrangements and back into the community and. There again is a lack of data that was available to the study on you know just the specific circumstances by which that was happening. But this is of concern to me and to us, and I'll explain that with the next slide, which kind of which juxtaposes on the left that the kind of the smaller orange bar is the total transitional housing and emergency shelter capacity. So that's kind of the, the first table of the nine shelter providers that I had shown. Put together, this is the total family capacity is in that bar. And then on the right, the, the kind of the larger bar is the hotel and motel voucher capacity. And in late 2020, that capacity grew from roughly 60, um, uh, from roughly 60 or 70 vouchers, which is kind of the blue part of that bar, kind of all the way up to um, a number that is that is a little bit higher than 350, probably about 357, 360 um, vouchers. And which, like I pointed out, is really kind of a breathtaking, overwhelming, very concerning increase but also what that has kind of unwittingly done is that has made the state service centers become the premier provider of temporary housing for homeless families in the state of Delaware to the point of to the point where far and away they provide more temporary housing for homeless families than all of the other shelter and transitional housing services combined and that's kind of the juxtaposition there and Again, this is kind of an extraordinary set of circumstances. This is something that nobody really anticipated, that nobody really planned for. And again, by all indications, the State Service Center did, did a great job with what they had in doing that. But with the prospect of this, of this capacity getting reduced again, kind of leads me to have concern about where these families are going, especially since the housing exits have been curtailed. And that's what I'll go into in a minute. And, and, um, and to where the shelter capacity is quite a bit lower. So especially if, you know, large numbers of families are leave the motels, the, ho the, the, the shelters are you know, physically not able to take up that capacity and that stands to be made even worse if the inflow increases. So there's a distinct danger that the, 
that the current capacity could be overwhelmed. And this is something which I want to stress has not happened yet, but between evictions and between COVID and between, um, between voucher capacity going down, this is a possibility that needs to be prepared for and that, you know, that we want to, to make aware of. And they'll go into that a bit more again when we get back to the recommendations. And then the other concern I have, which this, this slide kind of makes very clear. And again, I don't, I'm not pointing any fingers at any of the systems or any of the players in the system, but these two systems are very separate. Like I talked about before, these are two data systems that don't talk to each other at all and need to be combined so that you have one data system by which we can plan, by which we can get a better understanding of what's going on. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There is data compatibility issues. There are funding issues. There are other issues why these systems aren't coming together. You know, you ask different people, you get different reasons. But the bottom line is these are you know, from a data point of view, from a services point of view, effectively to silos. And one of the main recommendations that we need to have, that we have is that these two systems need to come together. And again, we'll, I'll come back to that again at the end of this presentation. Um, before Steve, I do that, however, yes. I wanted to just do a time check for you. Um, okay. We're at 2.45, um, so you still have time, but I just wanted to let you know. Thank you, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, and okay, and before uh, be, I'm sorry, before we get going to the permanent housing, there's a lot of other information on temporary housing that's in this section that I like Rachel nicely um, underscored here. Um, I don't have time to get into, but I do urge you to read the report that we came out with, but also what we did in terms of putting all of this information about temporary housing together, a lot of the information, a lot of the findings we have fit very nicely into a set of objectives that came out in the action plan that the Continuum of Care put out back in 2017, which was a little bit before my time, but which is which is a report that's essentially been sitting on the shelf and that really hasn't gotten much attention and has not gotten the attention that it deserves. And so along with reading our report, I would really, this is actually available on the for download on, this, on, um, on the link here and really encourage you to go through that report. And this still very much works as a roadmap or as kind of a working document for getting systems better coordinated. And um, again, this is in our recommendations. I'm not going to go into this much more other than to say that it's out there and that it really needs to get picked up again. And that's something that I would encourage the continuum of care and the Housing Alliance to pay more attention to. Um, now we're going into permanent housing. Um, Permanent housing, just like with temporary housing, there are different types of permanent housing. Um, the, and that I'll go over real quickly, that I'll give an overview. The first one is market rate housing. And this is, you know, if, um, if the shelter system were working in our ideal world, families would come in to shelter or would come into a, into a hotel or a motel, they would get on their feet, they would get a job or they would get some other income which would then let them again get housing in um, on the private market and would move out. Now, as we all know, that's kind of a pipe dream at this point. And most of the most, if not all of the homeless families that we see, the income that they have access to, even when they're working, is not nearly enough for them to, um, to be able to rent something on the private market. And this is a big problem, you know, this affordable housing problem is a big problem that's covered much better by a um, um, by a housing alliance document that came out less than a month ago. Again, this is on the same web, downloading this is available on the same web page that our reports available i'd encourage you to download that to look not only at the homelessness part but also at the housing part where they really do a nice job of laying that out and that's all that i'll i'll cover with the market rate housing the other you know just kind of another housing permanent housing stream that's available to homeless families whether they've been in temporary housing or not is rapid rehousing. Rapid rehousing is literally what it is when a family presents themselves 
as being homeless instead of going into temporary housing. They get um, they get short term rental assistance, um, case management assistance, other assistance as needed to get back rapidly into permanent housing. And so what this does is instead of keeping families homeless, it moves them into permanent housing. Um, it gives time limited assistance and ideally within within the amount, you know, once the time limited assistance winds down, which is typically a year or two, then they are able to maintain housing on their own and for more of a long term. Um, data nationwide shows that this model is effective in rehousing homeless and not only in, you know, basically keeping keeping families homeless as short a time as possible, if homeless at all, and then moving them back into more stable housing. Um, in Delaware, this has happened, and these are family. This is the number of families over the last four years that have participated in the rapid rehousing program. This is not necessarily the number of families who have who have received permanent housing, and for a couple of reasons, it's been difficult, and not just in Delaware, but in other states, for families to receive to receive permanent housing through rapid rehousing. One of the main reasons is that landlords are reluctant to rent to homeless families, especially in tight rental markets when other options are available. There is also, you know, to engage in rapid rehousing requires that, um, that, ag that provider agencies kind of retool a lot of times their um, services from temporary housing into a more permanent housing, um, into a more permanent housing paradigm. That's difficult sometimes. There's, um, you know, personnel. Another problem that's been, that's kind of been magnified in COVID is, you know, hiring the increased staff that's needed for rapid rehousing. And, but on the other hand, there has been a vast increase in resources available um, for, for expanding rapid rehousing, which I'm hoping that the panel and especially Barb and Dennis will comment more on. And that for us to put a dent into the, the size of the homeless population here in Delaware, this number needs to go up. Again, like with the, with the hotel motel vouchers, this is a very difficult problem. These are problems that face providers who are doing good, who are doing good jobs, but we all need to get together with the providers and Basically, we need to move the numbers up both in families who are getting into the programs and in those who are in the rapid rehousing programs to actually get to permanent housing. Um, you know, this is something that the resources are becoming available and we need to be doing a better job on. And I'm going to move on from that to the other kind of the main facet, which are vouchers, which are housing vouchers. I'm going to go over this quickly. And Again, the main source of housing vouchers are federal housing choice vouchers, which are commonly known as Section 8 vouchers, and just out of habit, I'll refer to them as of that as well. Um, Section 8 vouchers, and again, you talk to state service center um, key informants, you talk to, um, to, to key informants from shelters, and again, I, I appreciate everybody's very forthrightness. They'll be the first to tell you that the biggest problem they face is a problem of permanent housing supply. And one of the biggest aspects of that is that there are simply no Section 8 housing vouchers available for families, that the demand so outpaces the, um, the available supply that, that that Section 8 housing for families who are in temporary housing are kind of like unicorns. They're magical, but they're extremely rare. Um, the ARPA, the American Recovery Plan Act Assistance had some provisions for um, um, for vouchers that are that work a lot like Section Eight vouchers, which are emergency housing vouchers. Um, these came online for homeless families, and that are currently being distributed through Housing Alliance and through their centralized intake system. And the state of Delaware has gotten 120 additional um, vouchers, so basically 120 unicorns, which brings which kind of brings a much needed but kind of temporary relief in terms of a way to provide um 
to provide permanent housing for more either families or individuals and to kind of make a temporary dent in the number of in the homeless population um but that is kind of it's kind of i see it kind of as a down payment it's a you know it's it's very nice to get additional vouchers um in we, in the report, we look a bit about how those vouchers are allocated and show again how flaws in the system and also kind of point look look directly at how the housing alliance and how the continuum of care is kind of allocated those vouchers. And if the system were better aligned, the housing vouchers would make a bigger dent in the house, the homeless population. When you want to read more details on that, I'll need to refer you to the um to the actual report. But anyway, um, that's kind of a down payment in what could be available with the Build Back Better Act. And um, I think we've all heard about the Build Back Better Act and even in its kind of pared down version that hopefully is going to get passed. And you know, this is kind of high drama for those of us who follow housing policy, whether or not this does get passed, but they have provisions for up to $24 billion nationwide for housing vouchers. And if that were to happen, Delaware's share would be a game changer in terms of providing um, additional Section 8 or other housing vouchers that are available. So we have those three. The last point I want to make is in addition to the federal housing vouchers, there's also a state um, rental assistance program that's otherwise known as SRAP. SRAP is a limited program of housing vouchers, but they are available. Um, they're, they typically are made available to families and also to individuals who are receiving other types of assistance from other um, state programs. And so it kind of allows, um, it kind of facilitates addressing the needs of multi of families who have multiple needs and where their housing needs, if they're there, can be met. Like the federal vouchers, is much more demand than there are vouchers. But unlike the federal vouchers, the kind of, you know, we can make a push for expanding this voucher program and to where this could make a big difference and to where this being kind of a local state issue, the, um, the legislature, the state government has the potential to be more receptive to that. And one of the recommendations is to follow up on that. And so that in a nutshell is our permanent housing. The recommendations I'm not gonna spend much time on. These are the four that I've kind of mentioned already where we're talking about basically taking a thorough assessment of rapid rehousing, um, continuing hotel and motel voucher assistance at current levels, expanding, consolidating, and improving data coverage. These three are things that I've kind of gotten very, felt myself during this presentation is getting very emotional, as getting, as being very important to kind of writing this system and to making an effective response at you know, just kind of getting this homeless population size back down. I think these are prerequisites for making a difference. The research supports that. And this is a problem that we're also all in together. I don't want to point any fingers specifically. And, you know, and certainly, you know, in terms of our team and certainly, you know, in terms of my involvement with the continuum of care, this is not something that we're parachuting into looking around and saying, you all need to do it. It's, it's more a we all need to do this. Um, other recommendations are, again, I mentioned the action plan, and then these are five more that I've, many of which I've touched on, the SRAP, the coordination, the emergency housing vouchers, um, developing new affordable housing resources, which I'm hoping Barb and Dennis um, can, can talk about on kind of a bigger picture, and Nicole can also talk about on a Newcastle County level, and then finally, increasing non-congregate housing capacity um, using, you know, using ARPA money. And again, hopefully the, the panel can weigh in a bit more on that. And with that, I'm done. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> um, thank you so much for um, that great presentation of the report and its findings. Um, there is content there, of course, that isn't all going to be covered in a 45 to 60 minute presentation. So um, we did pop the link directly to the report in the chat. For those of you who haven't seen it yet, um, it is on Housing Alliance Delaware's publications webpage. 
Um, and we've continued to kind of put some things in the chat. So take a look, um, resources, reports, information. And of course, if you're interested in helping make sure we count all homeless families in the state in January of 2022, please feel free to consider vol volunteering to participate in the 2022 point in time count. Um, the link to do so um, to sign up is uh, in the chat as well. Um, so let's hear from our panelists. I'm really excited to hear what folks have to say. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing our panelists and um, opening with a question. Um, so we're joined by Dennis Colhane, a professor at the School of Social Policy and Practice at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he is a prominent social science researcher with expertise in the areas of housing, uh, housing policy and homelessness. And his work over the years has contributed very significantly to national and local efforts to address the housing and service needs of people experiencing homelessness, um, as well as internationally. Um, Nicole Waters has worked as the Director of Operations at the Newcastle County Hope Center since it opened in December of 2020 in response to the community's need for non-congregate sheltering during COVID-19. Hi, Nicole. Mm -hmm. um, many homeless families have been, currently are, sheltered at the Hope Center. Um, and she also oversees um, some HUD, uh, HUD homeless assistance funding, emergency solutions grant funding, community development block grant funding for Newcastle County, and has served in this role for 13 years. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, and Barbara Poppy is a nationally recognized leader in the areas of housing and homelessness. Um, she formerly served as the executive director of the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness under the Obama administration. She has served in a local leadership role at the Community Shelter Board in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, now is principal at Barbara Poppy and Associates, a consulting group that provides capacity building and results-oriented services to communities um, working to address affordable housing and homelessness. Um, her work uh, has taken particular interest in families and families with children and women um, and looking at the intersections between homelessness and employment, health care, public health, and human services. Thank you so much for being with us today, Barb. And Barb, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to start by asking you a question. Um, so you have been working for what the past 18 months here with communities working to respond to COVID-19 and homelessness um, at the national level and with some local communities as well. And as we heard from Steve, non-congregate sheltering has really been this critical piece of our response as it has been in many communities. Where do you envision that going? Where do you see community, other communities going with non-congregate sheltering? What role do you think that that will play or should play in our community strategy as we kind of work to look towards recovery from, from COVID-19? Great, well, thank you for the chance to be here with you. And I very much hope that we see an, a, um, more use of non-congregate sheltering settings for families. Uh, recently, I've been working with uh, the framework for an equitable response to COVID-19 and homelessness, and we just completed and issued a report about a month ago, which looked at um, using flexible crisis options like hotel and motel and master leased units in order to serve families. And we found this was particularly important because of the diverse family types that um, are needing assistance and that, that work is really important because otherwise they often get excluded, uh, whether it's because of the configuration of their family, uh, their um, cultural backgrounds, you know, they've got the presence of pets in the family and are often excluded or end up on long waiting lists because there is not flexible capacity. So we very much encourage communities to look at that. We identified nine places across the country that were doing this, both culturally specific programs programs serving um, domestic violence um, survivors, as well as programs really and systems geared toward addressing homelessness. And from the family's perspective, what when we interviewed people, what they said was how much more, how much, um, how much better it worked than the providers thought it was going to work, and that how much um, better able they were to serve families. And their experience was with the right set of supports, families actually move more quickly out of the non-congregate hotel settings than they did from the congregate shelters because the families were more quickly able to get focused on meeting, you know, on, on directing um, their lives to a direction of finding housing than when they were in a congregate shelter spending 
time trying to kind of manage the rules. The other thing that came out really clearly is from the perspectives of um, Black and other people of color is that oftentimes the, the rigidity of the congregate programs um, doesn't fit with our needs and oftentimes um, end up in conflict that, that is because of the way the program, the family congregate shelters are, are structured. So, um, I, so I remain very hopeful that we will think about this as a flexible resource as well as a family, a resource that can be used uh, with greater flexibility and serve a, a greater variety of family configurations than we are currently seeing served in typical congregate family shelters. Thank you, Barb. Um, and I think there are a number of things that you mentioned that I know have put, been put in place at the Hope Center to try to be more flexible. And is it because of the facility, they're able to be more flexible around things like pets and family configurations. So I think you, you mentioned a lot of things that kind of ring true. Um, I'm sure Nicole can speak to them. Um, I'm gonna actually uh, turn it to Dennis now and I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question, um, shifting gears a little bit um, before I get to Nicole. Um, sure. So kind of move, as, as Barb said, moving folks from whether it's a congregate or non-congregate setting, moving families out, um, we really are relying heavily in Delaware as are a lot of communities on rapid rehousing as our main tool for doing that, um, which of course um, requires units for people to move into. Um, but you know, it's our primary response to trying to move people out of homelessness and into housing. Um, we know it's been very successful over the years. Um, what we're having trouble with is scaling, right? Our rapid rehousing providers have been working really, really hard in a really challenging environment at a really challenging time doing this work. Um, the human infrastructure part of the work is really hard right now. So having the people, aside from the housing units, um, which is another part of the conversation we'll have, is having the people infrastructure um, to make that happen. Um, do you have any insights or thoughts about how we could think about structuring our rapid rehousing resp response, building our human infrastructure to do that work? Well, thank you, Rachel, for inviting me to be part of this discussion. And, um, you know, this is not a challenge that's unique to Delaware. Uh, a lot of places in the country were caught you know, unprepared for an influx of resources, which could go quite far, uh, including in Delaware, to expand rapid rehousing and, and to your point, um, have had a difficult time hiring people, uh, getting people who are qualified uh, to do the work. It's, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Um, I do know that, you know, some places are actually providing bonuses to people who are being hired, there are a number of strategies, of course, for trying to get people in the door who could be, uh, you know, employed for that purpose. Um, I even know uh, of a jurisdiction where they're looking at some student loan forgiveness for people coming out of MSW programs um, who, you know, uh, could be offered some loan forgiveness or, or enrolled in the federal public service program that provides a student loan repayment and which has been recently um, re-examined by the Biden administration to improve access to it. Um, so I think there's a number of those, those things, but uh, you know, it might also be that I think that looking at the whole process by which the program is structured in terms of you know, what are the contracts like, are there appropriate incentives on the part of the contracts for the providers to be paid for the outcome versus paid, you know, on a sort of a grant basis um, to do the work. Because what happens in a lot of places is money is left on the table. Uh, if they don't have the capacity to, to move the money out the door, it gets left on the table. Uh, and, and there may be a way to structure those contracts such that, uh, you know, there's incentives on the part of the providers and on the workers to, you um, do this work on a larger scale and to do it faster. Uh, so, because a concern would be that the time is going to pass and these dollars will disappear or get, you know, get brought, brought back and, um, you know, an opportunity will have been missed. Um, so I think that, uh, I, I think there are obviously, these are challenges not unique to Delaware, but um, it's, it's hard work, but, uh, you know, I think there are opportunities to try to improve the organization and, and recruitment for the for the program. Thank you. Thank you for, for your insights there. Um, 
Nicole, I think that this question flows really well from that one. So I'm going to ask you a question, which is, you see lots of homeless families every day, many of whom are getting rapid rehousing assistance on site at the Hope Center. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about the major challenges that folks are having getting out of the Hope Center and into housing in the community, um, whether or not some of what what we were talking about in terms of human infrastructure rings true to you um, and uh, challenges getting folks into units in the community, et cetera. Like, what are you seeing in terms of challenges? Uh, pretty much, uh, thank you again for allowing me to be here to talk about this. And pretty much what has already been mentioned, um, a lot of what's in the report, we, we know this, this has been um, something that we've known for many years. We know that rapid rehousing does work on uh, the onset of the pandemic before the Hope Center was even uh, available, uh, the Sheraton was even up for auction. We placed uh, in partnership with the uh, Division of State Service Center, we placed people in the hotels and, and supported that program and also uh, provided wraparound services and rapid rehousing dollars to many um, of our rapid rehousing providers throughout the state. And um, all three jurisdictions actually um, allocated monies to that. And to date, um, Newcastle County, out of our total 2.2 million of ESG uh, CV CARES money, we've allocated over $1.2 million just in Newcastle County alone for rapid rehousing. Our entire second allocation all went to rapid rehousing. Um, Delaware State Housing Authority and the city of Wilmington have also given money to rapid rehousing. The thing that I'm seeing most is the lack of decent, affordable, safe uh, units. So uh, the landlord partnerships, that's really what I'm seeing. I'm also seeing that in, in talking to um, our ESG providers, um, that it used to take a person, one person could look at a unit, one unit could have 10 people look at that unit. Now we're seeing, they're seeing 30 to 40 people competing for one unit. Well, our people are already experiencing homelessness. They're already coming with huge barriers and challenges. They're not coming with the best credit. They're coming with uh, things in their criminal um, in their criminal backgrounds. And the landlords are being very selective in, in their choices, even if it's attached to a program such as rapid rehousing or a voucher. Um, so those are the things that we're experiencing. I also do believe it is a capacity thing. I've, I've, I've thought about what can we do? Most of our um, programs are grant-based, they're reimbursed. The agency has to pay this money up front. We have to see that it's been spent. And that kind of money, even granting it to an agency that they have it, they still have to show that they've spent that money and then get reimbursed. That's very challenging. They are um, understaffed. There's a lot of people who've been affected by COVID. People have children. People have to stay home with their children. People can't put their children in daycare. They have to, you know, be home on Zoom with their children. So it, it it's a it's a whole plethora plethora of things that are going on, and I'm sorry, my mouth is dry. Um, so that are affecting um, the outcomes. It's not just like one thing specifically. So that's what what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that at the Hope Center right now, we have 384 people. 51% are households with children. We have over 197 children. 51% of those of our total population are children that are there. And we've had some moves. We've had up to like 70 moves into permanent housing. Um, and of those moves, 80% have been families, but it's just been so difficult for them to find housing, even with the supports um, from, from uh, Rapid Rehousing. Um, I wish we could solve this. I mean, if someone had the answer to this, I mean, it would be, I think it's, there's going to be a lot of answers to help because it's not just one problem. But one thing that I can say is that this is the first time in my 27 years of working for state and county government that I've ever seen state, local, county, city um, officials cross those silos, knock those silos down and, and those barriers and actually partner together. That was like the, the best thing we could have done were to, was to go into this partnership with the Division of State Service Centers and support their programs and they support our programs and put our heads together. And that's what we're gonna have to continue to do. I think we're gonna have to look for non-traditional landlords. Um, I, I'm gonna talk later about our housing locator, uh, Ms. Dana Mitchell, who is a chair of the COC. Uh, we're coming up with innovative ways to reach people, not looking for the regular, you know, apartment complexes that we know are going to be doing these credit checks and things of that nature, but look, mom and pop uh, landlords, churches, um, congregations, fraternity, we're, we really have to look and cast that net really wide uh, to uh, get resources and get people who may be interested in partnering with us. Um, because 
not necessarily it's a business for them, but because from the heart, they want to help a homeless person. Thank, Thank you, Nicole. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to ask one last question of all of our panelists. Um, so anyone, please feel free to jump in and then we're going to, um, Sarah's going to um, jump in with some questions from our participants. Um, so Steve mentioned this near the end, and I know um, uh, Nicole works in the local administration of these funds and uh, both you, Dennis and Barb, um, advise and think very thoughtfully about these federal resources. Um, so I think now we're seeing unprecedented challenges um, and unprecedented resources and potential solutions at the same time. Um, we've got a lot of ARP funds coming through lots of different avenues, whether it's from Medicaid reimbursement or um, HUD. So I was hoping each of you could talk a little bit about where you see the biggest opportunities being um, in those federal resources to target to homeless families to make a big difference and um, any advice you have for us here in Delaware. It's a very broad question. <laughs> well, I can jump in if you'd like. Um, I, my suspicion is there are still some CARES Act dollars left, which can still be spent through September 2022. And that could be used to do rapid rehousing. Again, assuming you can get the housing navigation and landlord recruitment process going. In addition, you can use the emergency rental assistance to commit for a longer term lease. Because part of the challenge from, from landlord perspective is they think of the rapid rehousing as being too time limited and that they're not gonna be able to you know, cover, uh, the client will be able to cover the cost of rent going forward. So pairing up expiring CARES money or existing rapid rehousing money with the emergency rent relief would enable commitments for a longer period of time on, on the lease. Um, of course, the other, key thing that's out there, it's not part of the ARP, uh, well, it was part of ARP, but uh, and it could be part of the bill that's going through, which is the child tax credit. Um, certainly, it, you know, providing a basic floor of income for all of these families and making sure families are applying and getting that uh, money because many low-income families actually haven't applied, haven't filed their IRS taxes or forms that would enable them to get that. But the tax credit has the ability along with the rapid rehousing to you know, provide families with sufficient income to be able to afford rent. Certainly now the money is available through for the child tax credit through the end of June, but if the bill passes, it will go at least again for another year. So it, it would seem that some of the challenges that landlords might be raising can be addressed with that that kind of resource and um, and then last I'll just mention because you mentioned that there's some Medicaid money that the home and community based services 10% increase that was given um, in some communities they're using that to bring in Medicaid funded case managers to work with families and individuals who have behavioral health issues and who can use the HCBS money to pay for housing navigation, move-in expenses and such. So it's kind of like rapid rehousing, but it's done with a behavioral health case management or case management team. Thank you. Um, do our other panelists have anything to add to, to that? I, certainly Dennis hit all of the, the high points, but I just would add a couple additional thoughts is um, everyone is getting home ARP dollars that can be used for housing development. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the targeting requirement on those can be quite diverse. So I would suggest you strongly advocate for those funds to be used um, for, uh, you know, that there's at least a, a set aside of that funding to create uh, deeply affordable or permanent supportive housing for families with children and particularly as they are uh, designing these is to think about the gap that I'm sure your community has for larger units, three bedrooms and up are probably in extremely short supply. You can extend your advocacy on this to include light tax developments, low-income housing tax credit and others, but be, the gap we're seeing in supply is only gonna get addressed if we actually also are advocating for increases in supply. So I'm very concerned that those home ARP dollars will not be 
deeply targeted because they're being administered by home um, administrators who tend to go with the 60 to 80% of area median income um, guidelines. And that's the kind of developers are looking at. So I would get to the table and see uh, what you can do in those particular spaces. Um, I would also just, I'd be remiss if I didn't, I didn't say, it's also a great time to rethink how you're prioritizing your resources and to be sure that you in fact are inclusive of all families. And I would particularly encourage you to be sure that pregnant women are included as members of families and not shunted to a single adult system. There is um, uh, strong um, evidence growing about poor birth outcomes for homeless pregnant women. And uh, this is an opportunity to really prioritize and ensure uh, that pregnant women who are also more likely to be impacted by COVID and have poor outcomes because of COVID, uh, and there are strong racial disparities in who experiences poor maternal as well as birth outcomes. So um, look, look at your, the way you're prioritizing resources and, and reconsider whether pregnant women and um, uh, very young children can get a relative priority with some of these resources. Thank you. Um, Sarah? I think we want to make sure to take some questions from our participants. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Sarah's been monitoring the Q&A in the chat. Um, take, take it away. I'm going to start with a question about childcare. Um, this is a report about families. And, and Nicole said that she has 50 families in her shelter. Um, so it's kind of a two-part question. The first part is, do we know how many homeless families have children who are not yet in kindergarten, are those families connected to early child care and education programs? And are the hotels, motels, shelters, system, are we working to provide any sort of child care options for families as they try and navigate through the system? So I think it might be a everybody question, but anybody who wants to jump in first. I do wanna clarify, we actually have, um... 200 children at the um, at the Hope Center, and 50, it's 50% 50 of our population are children. So we have Thank that. Um, yes. Yeah. So maybe Nicole, can you start then and do, like talk yeah. about the resources at the, at the shelter? We have a social services anchor on um, on site, uh, Friendship House, that handles our guest needs um, and our case management. If um, families um, do not have access to childcare, we make sure that they get access and connected to those mainstream resources like the state subsidized purchase of care program. Um, if they have school age ch children or um, under um, non school age children, we make sure that we do connect them uh, to those resources and those agencies. Um, kids, uh, kids count. Um, I, I, we actually did a presentation with them. They're aware of uh, the children that are um, located at our facility. Um, there was a and I may not know all these programs, birth to three uh, program. I think someone was on site uh, um, a few times uh, with that. But yes, there, there are um, resources for those uh, children and for those families and supports for those families. Now we don't have uh, child care on site. Uh, it is a county building. It's owned by uh, Newcastle County. Um, so there are certain things that we don't have on site, but we do have a homework club, a homework uh, camp. Parents cannot leave the facility and leave their children. Um, only during that time um, that they're at the homework club, but they have to remain on site. So we don't offer any childcare services uh, per se where kids are left and their parents leave the, the premises. But we do uh, make every effort to connect them to resources in the community to help them with their childcare needs. Also real quick, uh, CMIS data, those families that are in the CMIS system, 52% have children preschool age. So about half of them. So you can kind of get some idea of the extent that you have young children and families. The other piece I would just add is as, we, as I've talked with homeless families across the country over the last few years, I'm hearing a lot of families' uh, reluctance to place their children in congregate childcare settings, um, particularly with infants. Um, it's not just an issue of, there's very little infant childcare available, but also a concern about the relative safety even before the pandemic, certainly accelerated um, since we've had the pandemic. So I'm seeing some programs are trying to deal with these needs more creatively and finding flexible funds that they can help 
those individuals pay family or friends to keep the child so that mom or dad can go to work or do their education or, or whatever it is that they need to do to get to housing. Um, and so thinking about some other flexible alternative seems to be really important given the age group that really is kind of left out um, of you know, a school setting. Um, and I'll just add, um, Renee, uh, Director Beeman, um, nice to, to have you. I know I can't see you, um, but she also typed something in the chat here about their efforts. Um, a lot of um, uh, families that were placed in the state service centers throughout this past 18 months or so, um, the state service centers has been partnering with departments of education, and other divisions under DHSS um, to help get education materials, laptops, internet, that all that kind of stuff. Um, to the families at the hotels and motels. And um, uh, uh, Director Beeman and uh, Deputy Director Faith um, have put some information in there about their work um, in the chat. So take a look. Yeah, thank you so much for your answers. Um, so I'm going to kind of mush together a couple questions because we only have a few minutes left. Um, but there was a question in the chat about our, whether there are extensive reports on veterans homelessness. Um, and we know that you know, there was the mayor's challenge to end um, veterans homelessness across the country. We know that that did have an impact on the number of homeless veterans. Um, there are also questions in the chat about like what kind of the, what can we do Christian, right? Can we give more incentives to landlords to take vouchers? Should we be building more? Um, so. I'd love to hear like in the kind of vein of can we end homelessness? Um, in addition to the things that we've already talked about, should, what other things should Delaware be doing to think about how we can model our next year so that we don't have the same outcomes or worse? What is the next thing and can we do it? On the issue of veterans homelessness, I'll just note that in addition to the AHAR data, which are lagged, and therefore that's an issue, but they do track the, uh, you know, the number of homeless veterans um, by state, so you can see that. Further, you can actually look at the COC level on the new HUD website, which provides the dashboards for um, you know, every, every continuum of care in every state. And those dashboards will enable you to look at year over year trends, for example, with regard to the number of homeless veterans uh, in Delaware. So um, that's a resource that's available. Of course, the VA, the National Center on Homelessness Among Veterans, also uh, posts some data on its website of, of people that they're serving. So those are a couple of resources and that's available by state. I think on the issue of what I would recommend you make sure you're really leaning into over the next year is the inclusion of families with lived expertise of homelessness in all phases from planning to evaluation uh, and uh, participation in, in implementation. Uh, I, I think too often we are, um, I've heard so many people say to me, I got invited to a focus group, but then they never took my advice anyway. So I just wanna caution against very, uh, I think there's a lot of somewhat insincere or disconnected consultations that are occurring. And they, um, and these individuals can be your strong partners in designing programs that are better aligned with the individual's needs. And it, it does take some effort, it is well worth it. As a person who used to, I was executive director of a homeless serving agency, and what I learned during the five years that I ran this group called Friends of the Homeless was that consistently when I went to the clients and said, what is it you need? They always came up with practical ideas that were far less expensive to implement <laughs> than the ideas when I asked the professional staff what they thought was needed. And so I don't think we should be afraid of reaching out that they're gonna come up with ideas that we can't implement. But they also can really speak to some of the systemic challenges that they face. And one of the issues I've learned about through this work with the, the framework is the over-policing of families who are experiencing homelessness and, and not, um, not just um, with the police, but actually with child welfare and the quick to call 
um, child welfare, and then the families losing their children. And so I think it's also a really important time to rethink our practices that are happening that we think we must do and put an, a question out there as to whether they really are advancing um, the best interests of the children and their parents. So I'm, I'm hoping there's some really good reflections and action taken as we, as we more closely listen to the people we intend to serve. Thank you very much for that. Um, and given that we do only have a moment left, I wanna make sure we get to kind of the big picture of what Steve was presenting on the clogged drain. Um, <laughs> there may not yet be more people coming into the sink or you know, falling into the tub, whatever, <laughs> whatever uh, water holding container you wanna think of it as, um, but we want to make sure that doesn't happen. And so we know we have emergency rental assistance funds and the millions available. Um, our state housing authority that administers those funds for the state recently put out a $5 million RFP for community partners to hire, to get people in the community, helping people apply, doing targeted outreach to make sure that money can get in people's hands. Um, I know eviction prevention and homeless prevention aren't always the same, but they can sometimes be. And so I was hoping I could hear from panelists briefly before we go, we don't wanna see more people fall into the bathtub or the sink. Um, so uh, do you have any last parting words for us? Um, there was a question presented by one of, uh, brought by one of the uh, participants here. Oh my gosh, how do we make sure this doesn't get worse and more people don't become homeless um, in 2022? So any thoughts? <laughs> well, I, I, there's um, with the framework, we've been looking at this, what are the differences between eviction prevention, homelessness prevention and diversion? And the reality is the practice is all the same. Resources that people need are all the same. It's really the point in time that those resources are made available. And as a homeless assistance, um, system, the focus really needs to be first on diversion, making sure that diversion conversations, as well as access to flexible funding, including uh, rental assistance to deal with arrearages or move-in costs are available at every point of contact, and that these are explored before shelter admission. There's a whole section in our report that talks about kind of what we see as some of those best practices and then that. But I think that's the single most important thing to do. I think homelessness prevention and eviction prevention can be important, uh, but we have to be very careful that eviction prevention um, helps many more households than those who would experience homelessness. It's not to say there's not value in doing it, um, but be sure as a homeless assistance system, you are really strong on all of your diversion practices. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And if I could add, Newcastle County has always been, um, you know, a strong advocate to, to yes, decrease homelessness and, and help people before they even enter that homeless system. So with our regular CDBG funds, we've always allocated money toward diversion or homelessness prevention projects. And now with the CARES uh, Act funding, we were able to take our CDBG CV funds and allocate $100,000 to our uh, Community Legal Aid Society uh, to help people who were faced with eviction. Because yes, we do not want people being evicted at this time. Um, and never do we want it, but we really don't want to have more people into that, that drain or that, that tub that you, that you described there. Um, so we're, we're happy that we've partnered with them um, to do that. And, um, and, and that's how we're handling it here at Newcastle County. Thank yeah, you, Nicole. Of course, the, the, I think that as the report pointed out, one of the big drivers, the biggest driver of the increase in census is length of stay, uh, not more families. And, and that's really what the rapid rehousing program can address. So uh, it'll be important to put that strategy and that goal together. Yes, yes, we have, yes. Yeah, we, we yes. knew that we wanted to make sure that, yeah, we, we poured all of our second allocation into rapid rehousing and having these agencies work together and communicate um, to, to keep people um, out of homelessness or if they were experiencing homelessness to be as brief um, and non-recurring as possible. Well, we are at 3.31 and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. This was a great conversation, a much needed one, a very timely one. Um, so thank you, Dennis, Barb and Nicole very much for your time. Thank you, thank you Steve, thank you. for uh, your presentation today and your work on the study. And I know many of you um, put 
time into the study by just the work you do or the data you enter into CMYS. Thank you for that. Um, and everything you all have been doing to help homeless families. So thank you everyone. Um, and I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Stay safe, everyone. You too, Nicole.